Welcome to Chemistry, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in today's video we're looking at some details of electronic structure. Now, if you've made it to this video, hopefully you have learned how to write electron configurations already. If you have not learned how to write an electron configuration, then you need to go back and do that. That is, that is something that you have to do before you can get to this video. Now, when we say electron configurations, well, first of all, you might remember that there are there was this stadium model that we looked at uh, in the earlier uh, videos in this module where we had this you know there's this nucleus in the middle and then we have these levels of the stadium and then inside those levels we have the little sections of the of each level and then some of these sections had other smaller boxes in there too in which we were able to put arrows well in this stadium model of the atom that we used in these previous videos, scientists, chemists, physicists don't actually call these levels of the stadium. That's not what they're actually called. Each level of our stadium that we had in our drawing represents what we call an energy level. Sometimes that's called an electron shell. Those terms are essentially interchangeable. So energy levels, electron shells, every level of the stadium represents an energy level. So if you had a stadium model in which three of the stadium levels were occupied, we'd say that three of the energy levels or three of those electron shells had electrons in them where they were, they were occupied. Let's try another uh, uh, way of classifying this. In some of these levels, we had multiple sections. So I know that in the first level, we only had S, but in the second level, we had S and we had P as well. In the third level, we had S and P, and then we had D as well. We call those deserving in our uh, little uh, illustration there. Every one of those sections is what we call in science or in chemistry or in physics a sublevel. And so in science, we talk about, for example, the 1S sublevel or the 3D sublevel. That's how those are uh, actually described. Sometimes they're called subshells. That's the same thing when we say subshell or sublevel, the same thing. Now, if we take some of these sublevels, we notice that several of them have multiple boxes. Now, the S sublevel only has had one box in our model here. Uh, the P sublevels each had three boxes. The D sublevels each had five boxes. If we got as high as the F sublevel, it had seven. Well, each box or each row of seats, as we sometimes called it, is called an orbital. Now, we'll talk about what an orbital is here in a few minutes, but several, most of these sublevels have multiple orbitals. Now, in each box or in each orbital, we placed arrows. We placed a maximum of two arrows. Well, each arrow represents an electron. And the fact that one of the arrows or, or electrons is spinning up and the other electron is pointed downward, that refers to the fact that the two electrons in an orbital are actually spinning in opposite directions. So if one is spinning like, whoops, if one is spinning like this, one is spinning in the opposite direction. So I know that's kind of hard to do, but you know, if you can have one spinning like this, one spinning like that, then that can be what you can imagine uh, these electrons are doing. Now, there are some rules that we have for filling these orbitals. Now, we've learned them already. If you followed through on my two previous videos about uh, electron configurations and the stadium model of the atom, then you really you already know these rules. We just have to give them names. Now, the first rule that we talked about basically says that electrons are added to orbitals in a specific order, not randomly. So what that means is we always started with the 1s, and then we go to 2s, and then to 2p, and then to 3s, and so on. It's in that very specific order. And even within those uh, sublevels, we, we actually assigned arrows into the boxes in a very specific order. Uh, we don't say, you know, today we'll start with 3d, and then we'll do... Uh, we'll throw one in 4f, and then we'll have one in 2s, and then 1s, and then, you know, it, no, it's not like that. These electrons are added very specifically in a very specific order. That's called the Aufbau principle. 
Now, the alphabet principle basically just says, you know, you have to add them in order. So we always start with 1s and we progress, you know, 2s, 2p, and that's the alphabet principle. Alphabet is basically just a German word that essentially means in ascending order. So that's what that means. Now, there's another principle that we used. And we talked about this pretty early on. We said electrons are added to different orbitals until they are all occupied. Then they start to double up. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, you might remember in our previous, in our, uh, in, in a previous video, uh, we had, I think this was the 2p sublevel. And the first electron we added to this orbital. And then the second one, we didn't add to the following orbital. I'm sorry, we didn't add to the first orbital, rather. We added it to the second orbital. I think that was for carbon. And then the third one went in here. And then, once they all had one, then we could start to double up. So if you had four electrons, it looked like this. It did not uh, look like this, where you had, you know, if we have four, well, we'll just kind of scrunch them up all close to each other. Nope, that's not how it works. That is wrong. The name for this rule is called Hunt's rule, sometimes pronounced Hun's rule, but uh, Hunt's rule is what this is uh, called. Basically just says one arrow to a box until they all have one, then you can start to double up. That's Hunt's rule. Now, there's another rule. You might have noticed that when we stuck these arrows into the boxes, they were in opposite directions. The arrows, or the two electrons in an orbital, are spinning in opposite directions. So one is going in one direction, one's going in the opposite direction. Right? That is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And that's basically saying that if you have two electrons in an atom, those two electrons cannot have the same quantum states. And so the only way to keep them separate is to have them spinning in opposite directions. So that's the Pauli exclusion principle. Now the fourth rule is one that we haven't really talked about yet. It basically says it is impossible to predict the exact location of a moving electron. Basically, we know that electrons are uh, constantly in motion. They're always moving. And so you can't know exactly where they are. We can predict approximately about where it's going to be with a pretty good level of accuracy, but never exactly. That's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that was... Uh, basically uh, an uncertainty principle that helps us to understand that th these electrons are not in specific ordered places, like tracks on an orbit, like uh, Niels Bohr possibly thought. No, we know that these electrons are in, uh, they're basically able to move around quite a bit. So we know that there are some exceptions to the electron configurations. Let's take a look at some of the exceptions to the uh, alphabet principle. Uh, you need to know these. The first one is chromium. If you look at the periodic table, you would expect chromium to end with 4s2, 3d4. But actually, that's not what happens. It's actually 4s1, 3d5. And so what we think happens is, you know, here's the 4s, and we think it would be 4s2 and then 3d4. Let me draw the boxes here. You know, like you'd had one, two, three, four. But then we'd have the 3D sublevel is about one electron away from being half filled. We think that half filled sublevels are uh, kind of stable. And so what happens, at least we believe this is what happens, is that this electron right here actually gets promoted to 3D. And so that's why it's 4S1. 3d5. So that's chromium. You need to know that exception. Now here's another one. An element right underneath it on the periodic table essentially does the same thing. So molybdenum, looking at where it is on the table, you would expect it to be 5s2, 4d4, but it doesn't do that. That's not right. It promotes that last s electron, so it's 5s1, 4d5. So it essentially does the same thing here, except with 5s and, and 4d. Now if we get toward the farther right-hand side of the transition metals, copper is an exception 
to our expected electron configurations. You know, copper, if you look at the periodic table, you'd expect it to be, let me just go ahead and draw this out, you'd expect it to be 4s2 and then 3d, put the five orbitals in there, you'd expect it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 3d9. But as it turns out, that's not what happens. Because we can see here that this 3d sublevel is just one electron away from being completely filled. And as it turns out, that means that the fourth energy level, or I'm sorry, that the third energy level is one electron away from being completely filled. So what we believe happens is this last electron here, that last 4s electron, gets promoted to 3D. So it allows this 3D sublevel to be completely filled and so it's it's stable, it's happy. And so it's actually 4S1 3D10. You do need to know that. Now an element directly underneath it does basically the same thing, silver. You'd expect it to be 5S2 4D9, but it's not. It does essentially the same thing. It takes that last S electron and promotes it to D, so it's actually 5s1 for D10. So these are some exceptions to the expected electron configurations that you need to know in this class. Now before we finish, let's talk about the shapes of the orbitals. When we talk about orbitals, these are essentially places where electrons can be. Electrons are not in, you know, spinning in this nice circular track like maybe the Niels Bohr model would, would, would lead us to believe. Electrons are able to buzz around all over the place. However, if we were to draw, you know, the nucleus is right here, and we start drawing places where electrons could be, well, you're going to find that an s orbital is essentially going to look like this. It's going to be roughly this spherical shape and occasionally it ventures out of there, but not very often, about maybe 10% of the time or so. So s orbitals are spherical. Now p orbitals, if we were to, you know, here's the nucleus, and if we were to imagine where the electron could be buzzing around here at different moments in time, then we could probably get a shape that would look kind of like this. So, you know, it's kind of a figure eight shaped, or maybe a dumbbell shaped, something like that. Occasionally the electrons will venture out of there, but most of the time they're in that uh, figure eight shape. Now, the last one we're gonna talk about is the d orbital. So if the nucleus is right here, and we wanna plot where the electrons are in a d orbital, well, and this is a little bit harder for me to plot because simply because the shape is just that much more uh, just that much more complex. It looks like we roughly have something that looks like a butterfly or kind of a four-leaf clover. You know, occasionally the electrons will venture out of that region, but if we look at what that looks like, this is essentially a four-leaf clover. So, you know, every now and then the electrons will venture out of there, but most of the time they're going to be inside that. So the s orbital is spherical. The p orbital has this figure eight shape. And most of the time the d orbitals have this uh, four-leaf clover shape, although there is one type of d orbital that actually looks like something else. All right, well, that's, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you uh, learned a little bit of chemistry. Hope you learned some of these very difficult concepts uh, about the rules for electron configurations, even those exceptions can be tricky at times. If you like the video, please uh, smash that like button. Uh, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. This is Jeremy Krug, uh, Krug, excuse me, I mispronounced my own name. Join me again, where hopefully we can learn some more chemistry together.